Hello, I hope you're doing fine. So today I'm going to continue with the topic of identical particles. Mm. I restructured the section a little bit. So I'm actually going to continue with the spin and atoms. And I'll revisit in the middle um, the topic of uh, basically the symmetry or anti-symmetry of uh, many particle wave functions of identical either fermions or bosons. So let me start sharing the screen um, in order to give more uh, guidelines for the lecture. Okay, this is another thing, but let's go to this one. All right, so, okay. Continuing the topic with identical particles, I'm gonna start talking about spin. Then I'm gonna revisit uh, the topic of the many particle wave function and it's symmetry uh, in terms of the general asymmetrization principle. So we're not gonna limit ourselves to the case of only two identical particles, but actually N. And uh, the reason I need to give more guidelines is because uh, we need to add the spin considerations that we have so far. Kind of like, well, not exactly avoided, but at least um, ignored for a moment. And after that, I'll talk about some generalities of atoms um, given the previous considerations and that would be the end of the lecture. So, okay, regarding spin, so far we haven't considered it. And uh, it must be included in the description, not only of basically an individual particle, but for systems of identical particles. So, okay. Let's think uh, for example purposes that we have a single fermion uh, like an electron and the complete wave function would be specified by the spatial part, which is uh, Psi uh, times the basically spinner. So which uh, we're gonna use a chai function or a chai um, letter to denote it. And the spinner of course indicates for the electron the spin orientation. Again, Psi is basically the spatial part, the position wave function part uh, so far. And at this point, this is what we have only considered, but today we're gonna include the spin in the consideration. So what happens when we have two electrons, right? Okay, what we know by postulates of quantum mechanics is that essentially for a system of many particles, the total wave function for the system of many particles must be anti-symmetric for fermions. And so when we say the total wave function, we mean the consideration of both the spatial part and the spin part. So we, uh, for the system of two identical particles, basically we can consider uh, some sort of uh, product state where you have the uh, psi part over here, the spatial part, considering the two positions of the particles and then the spinor uh, related to the two particles. So basically four systems of two particles, you can separate the spatial part from the spin part. And um, it must be mentioned that this might not work for three or more electrons, but for two electrons, we can do this in the separation. But anyways, um, because we have a system of two electrons, uh, which are fermions, uh, their total wave function, meaning this one, not only restricted to position, but the whole position times spin and chilada uh, must be anti-symmetric. And so under exchange of particles, therefore the following symmetry happens. Um, basically, if you do an exchange of particles, uh, when you go from one to two to two to one, there is a minus sign due to the anti-symmetry of the total wave function. Now, um, the spatial part we have uh, studied so far, basically we have to be more explicit about the spin part of our two electron system. So which are the combined spin states that we can have? Um, I'm not sure if you saw this part on your previous quantum mechanics course or not, but in any case, I'm gonna quickly self-include it here. So, okay, um, individually the electrons have, uh, can have state uh, up or down. Um, what happens when we consider the two systems, right? I mean, there is spin one half particles each one and we have two of them. So there is one case where essentially um, uh, we have the triplet configuration 
where this is described by quantum numbers S and M, where S is one and M basically the component uh, minus one, zero, one. And these SM states for the triplet are one, 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 zero, and one minus one. One, one is in the case where the two spins are up. Um, one minus one, uh, it's basically the case when the two spins are down. And for one, zero, um, basically, look, they have uh, anti-aligned spin, but the important part is that the wave function is symmetric uh, on their exchange. So, which also happens for one, one and one minus one, because in those other two cases, basically the spins uh, point in the same direction. So the triplet configuration is distinguished by the feature that uh, the spin part is a symmetric function. And on the other hand, uh, you have the anti-symmetric spin function case, which is uh, the so-called singlet state where uh, the quantum numbers are S equal to zero and M equal to zero. Uh, so yeah, for the triplet, all uh, states have s equal to one. For singlet, s equal to zero, which restricts m to be zero. And so the um, spin or zero zero in this case, for the combined spin state, is not only of anti-alignment but uh, anti-symmetric, because now you have a minus in the linear combination. So under an exchange, you would pick a minus sign. Again, the singlet state is anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange. Um, so basically, if you want the total wave function for the system of two electrons to be anti-symmetric, and uh, you know that it's made of the spatial part times the spin part, for the case of the singlet state, which is anti-symmetric, it would need to be multiplied by a symmetric spatial part. And likewise for the triplet states, which are symmetric under particle exchange, they must be multiplied by an anti-symmetric uh, position wave function. So this is the way spin is handled for the case of two particles. Um, let's see, am I missing to, yeah, I'm missing to say uh, one last thing, which um, is that uh, basically a more careful statement of the Pauli exclusion principle is, uh, that it formally allows um, two electrons to be in the same position state as long as their spin is uh, basically in a singlet state so that no distinguishable features for two electrons are exactly the same, right? I mean, if their spatial part essentially or the position thing is the same, the spin has to be different, which is the, well, at least for the singlet state, it's a feature, right? So in any case, and it also satisfies um, the basically total anti-symmetry of the, of the total wave function, which is um, how you derive Pauli exclusion principle. So, okay, this is basically a more careful statement of the Pauli exclusion principle, um, adding spin considerations. And yeah, I mean, at least for the particles, the inclusion is not too difficult. You play with the anti-symmetries and symmetries due to this being a product state um, for more particles, it might be a little bit more complicated, but you can indicate some generalities, which is what we're gonna do now. Um, so again, we revisit uh, basically parts A and B and the symmetries of the many particle wave functions uh, for identical uh, fermions or bosons, but now for N particles in general, and we're gonna mention what is the generalized symmetrization principle. So, um, yeah, let me see. Okay, some things I have already mentioned. Right. So um, let's think now of uh, systems of two identical particles, not only fermions, but possibly fermions or bosons. And we have again our abstract uh, particle exchange operator, where basically, okay, you have a state one, two, describing your system of two particles. And then under the particle exchange, basically, uh, two goes to one and one goes to two. So the particle exchange operator exchanges particle one with particle two by definition, uh, but meaning that it exchanges the positions and the spins, meaning like all the characteristics that distinguish the system, right? Not only position, which is what we were doing before. So now that we have added the spin and the considerations, we basically know that the particle exchange operator will exchange the positions and the spins of particle one with particle two. 
So uh, yeah, that's important because before we had not added the spin in the considerations for two particles, but there are still some features that hold, which um, this algebraic uh, structure would let us um, find the eigenvalues of P one, two in terms of the, it's a square, it's still gonna hold. And so the particle exchange operator is still gonna have eigenvalues plus minus one. So we still have the thing or the feature that the eigenfunctions of the particle exchange operator are either symmetric or anti-symmetric under particle exchange. The symmetric case, of course, is the case of eigenvalue plus one. And the anti-symmetric case is uh, the situation for the eigenvalue minus one. So, um, there is something else to be mentioned, which we can uh, study by analyzing the Hamiltonian, which is that this uh, symmetry or anti-symmetry is preserved over time uh, if it's uh, satisfied by the wave function at the initial condition. And so we'll do that basically by analyzing the time evolution, which can be related to the Hamiltonian. So um, we don't need any more this assumption that the particles are not interacting because uh, we're not going to give a specific form of the Hamiltonian or um, that the potential is uh, time in, uh, independent. We can even have the case of basically a time dependent potential where the potential can also consider interactions between the particle one and particle two. So the important feature of these systems are precisely they are systems of identical particles Therefore, in quantum mechanics, they're literally indistinguishable. Their masses are equal, for example, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not important. The potential uh, must satisfy uh, basically this symmetry, right? I mean, if the particles are indistinguishable, when you evaluate it at R1, R2, and time, it's the same as evaluating at R2, R1, and time, if the particles 1 or 2 and are indeed identical, because there is no way to know which one is who. So basically, if you were to mysteriously changing from position, since they're the same particle, the physical situation has to be the same. So uh, we're going to prove that this implies that the particle exchange operator comes with a Hamiltonian. So we're going to study basically the commutator applied to the general state 1, 2 for our system of two particles. Uh, by definition, the commutator is this. Uh, then basically, you know, the way commutators are defined, etc. So the first part is basically applying P12 to H of 1, 2 and minus H of P12. This is the easy part, right? Because essentially this makes it to 1 and then this is H of 2, 1. Now you have H of 1, 2 and essentially the fact that the potential uh, has this symmetry given that uh, the particles are indistinguishable since they're identical means that when you apply the particle exchange operator to H of one, two, you'll also get H of two, one because the situation is indistinguishable. And I mean, the kinetic energies are simpler because those are essentially the sums of the individual kinetic energies and that's separable. Uh, so that it's clear that that will be also indistinguishable given that the particles are identical. So because of that, the commutator is zero and therefore they're compatible observable. And so if you go into the time evolution of the average of these observable, uh, which is P12, the particle exchange operator, it's evolution over time, meaning a total derivative. It's basically the uh, average of the partial derivative plus I over H bar, the average of the commutator. This is a result that you probably saw at the, um, at the previous course on quantum mechanics. If not, I mean, it's basically in the first sections of prefix. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, kind of interesting that it has some analogies with classical situations. But nevertheless, um, if we analyze each one of these terms, we already prove that the commutator is zero. So this term would vanish. And the particle exchange operator doesn't have any intrinsic, uh, basically, uh, dependence on time, you know, like time uh, dependent as uh, you would get a non zero result when applying the partial derivative. So both of these two terms vanish. And what this means is that the average of P12 doesn't change over time, in particular for its own eigenfunction. So if we start with an eigenstate of P12, either anti-symmetric or symmetric, 
And we know those eigenfunctions basically or eigenstates uh, are such that when you apply P12 R plus minus uh, one two, since the eigenvalues of P12 R plus minus one, then basically uh, if you compute the average, which is okay, the average of this is uh, the sandwich of the uh, brackets, et cetera. So bra one two, P12, one two. One two. So P12 applied to one two is plus minus uh, one <laughs> times uh, one two. So those are the eigenfunctions, which you can take out and then you have inner product of the function with itself, which is one. So this is plus minus one. So this is telling you that, um, well, this is the average of the uh, particle exchange operator for its eigenfunctions. And also the previous result is telling you that this won't change over time. So basically if you started anti-symmetric, you'll keep being anti-symmetric over time evolution. And likewise, if you start with a symmetric wave function totally, meaning position plus spin, uh, it will keep being symmetric. So um, let's see. Uh, well, this is important, of course, um, meaning that they have some well-defined symmetric features. And um, hmm. let's see what else. Yeah, I mean, this is just a little bit of a rephrasal of what we have stated before which is that uh, bosons have a total, um, well, symmetric total wave functions uh, with the plus eigenvalue. So considering both position and spin, they have the symmetry under particle exchange and the full wave function for two identical fermions is anti-symmetric under particle exchange. So that's the case of the eigenvalue minus one. Of course, this is by postulate in a way, but it's fine. Um, so two one is equal to uh, minus one two. Now, how to extend this um, to a system of uh, n particles briefly? I won't go into details because I have mentioned, for example, for the case of three electron situations, get a little bit more complicated that you cannot um, simply, you know, separate the spin and position by a product. But something can be said in general in the sense that for a system of n identical particles basically by postulate of quantum mechanics, the full wave function must be symmetric or anti-symmetric under exchange of any two particles. So basically let's say that you have the state, right? The one, two, i, j, blah, blah, blah. And uh, notice that the statement is that must be symmetric or anti-symmetric under the exchange of any two particles. So you're just gonna exchange a given pair of two particles, you know? So basically all the others remain the same except for i and j, which you will exchange, and j will go where i was and i where j was. So this is precisely the situation. And when you do that particle exchange of i with j, you pick up a minus or a plus. So again, this is the postulate of quantum mechanics, full wave state symmetric or anti-symmetric under exchange of any two particles when you exchange only say particle i with particle j. Uh, and again, I, this is the total wave function. This total wave function would consider both spin and position, uh, regardless of its complicated way, possibly. And um, well, the plus sign, as you know, of course, is for an, a system of n bosons. So in that case, you have a wave function or a wave state representing a system of n identical uh, bosons and uh, it's a total wave function considering both the position and spin and the minus sign represents the basically system of n uh, identical fermions and that many particle wave function total spin and position has to be anti-symmetric and this um, basically postulate is the generalized symmetrization principle so that's uh, it's a statement and yeah, I mean, just to briefly say that basically it extends the previous considerations for the two particle systems to n identical particles when we basically um, exchange only two particles. Any permutation can be decomposed into uh, exchanges of pairs of two. So this is enough to completely determine things. Um, so yeah, that's the revisiting of the uh, many particle wave functions uh, of identical fermions and bosons. And now that we know spin, um, and yeah, after we have uh, considered spin and the revisiting of the identical bosons or fermions for n particles, 
uh, we're going to consider atoms because uh, atoms need a little bit of uh, uh, spin consideration, at least to know how many electrons you can put in a given orbital, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do is to indicate first uh, the Hamiltonian for the general case, then study in more detail or, uh, the particular case of helium, and then indicate um, uh, some general features that uh, mimic the situation in helium. Uh, happening for all other elements, and that lets you analyze a little bit the periodic table of the elements. So I think this is a pretty cool topic, uh, and this is fundamental for any physicist. Uh, usually it would be part of a course in atomic and molecular physics, but I think at this point we're prepared to handle this, and uh, the statement will be um, concise enough to relate to what we're doing right now. So. Okay, in any case, um, let's think that you have a neutral atom, right? Uh, so the atom is neutral, meaning that it has as much positive as negative charge, and it has a given atomic number C. So the Hamiltonian is basically, um, well, it's a system of, in a way, if you want C plus one particles, because you have the Z electrons since the atom is neutral, um, and the nucleus. Now, what's inside the nucleus, we don't care at this point. But in any case, um, we're going to have to do an approximation um, that the nucleus is fixed and we can somehow ignore it because it's very heavy, so it stays in the same position. We need to do that because this analysis of, let's say, uh, hydrogen, where we transform the two-body problem into uh, uh, one body problem reduced, cannot be done um, even for helium, you know? Uh, so you need this approximation anyways. So bear with me. Um, let me describe first the Hamiltonian. It's basically made of the sum of the individual contributions of the kinetic uh, energies for uh, each one of the C electrons, which is why you have an index J going from I to C, identifying each electron uh, in the writing of the Hamiltonian only. And um, then what you have is basically the potential of attraction between the, each one of the electrons and uh, the nucleus. So the nucleus has a positive charge of uh, Z, um, and then the electron, uh, say, in the um, position Rj, uh, and of course this is uh, the radius, uh, it's not the vector. But uh, basically, well, you have this Coulombic potential where you have the charges C times minus C. That's why you have minus C squared, then blah, 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 constants important. And then the Coulombic uh, potential, which depends on one over um, Rj, where Rj is a distance to the nucleus. So yeah, they have mass M. That's not so important. Um, the charges. Um, because it defines the design of attraction. And then uh, at this point, I mean, if you look at this, the Hamiltonian what's inseparable. Uh, there is one term though, which makes the problem uh, not separable and not so easy to analyze, which is if you consider basically the electron-electron repulsion. So the electrons interact with each other because they have charge, they have the same negative charge and there's gonna be a repulsion potential. In fact, if you consider basically, um, well, of course, E squared is E times E. So the, in the Columbic interaction, um, the, 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 the charge is involved. But here what you have is basically the distance between the electrons, right? So now you indeed have vectors Rj. Uh, so this is basically the vector uh, of the distance between the two electrons. And then, of course, we care about the norm uh, or the distance. Um, so, uh, well, the way we're doing this uh, sum is that basically we're considering um, for all indexes and then all the other electrons. That's why we exclude the case um, uh, J equal K. Uh, so we consider all the cases where you study the interaction of an electron, let's say in a position Rj with all the others. So that's why you don't consider 
basically a self-interaction, k equal j. And because you would uh, count twice in this sum, uh, think about it basically, in one case, you may have rj r minus rk, in the other, basically rk minus rj in a way. So because you're counting twice by this, you need a factor of one half. So in summary, the Hamiltonian for basically um, the system where you assume that the nucleus is fixed because it's very heavy, uh, is that you have the individual contributions of the kinetic energies and the potential attraction energies to the nucleus for each one of the electrons. And then the interactive uh, repulsive potential which couples the problem. And um, well, this term precisely is the one responsible to making the problem not uh, fully separable. So uh, that's an issue. Because if we only had this term, whew, that would be easy. I mean, it would be the same handling as we've done before. Propose uh, separable functions, since the Hamiltonian is separable, uh, after you consider separation of variables, etc., simply add the linear combinations and you're done. Exactly, analytically, that's not possible due to this term. However, this problem becomes very complicated even for helium. And so we'll be essentially a force to neglect it. Uh, so of course, it's known from the beginning that that can only be a very coarse approximation. Nevertheless, we have to do it. So anyways, um, what I want to say is that having expressed the Hamiltonian, and let's see, have I missed uh, saying anything? Uh, I don't uh, think so. No. Well, <clears throat> in any case, this will be the Hamiltonian uh, operator acting over a wave function representing the basically C electrons, since the nucleus is fixed and we're not, except for being like somehow like some sort of infinite mass in this approximation, we're not uh, considering it. Uh, so you have a wave function representing the Z electrons uh, and then the time coordinate. And you have Schrodinger equation where the Hamiltonian of psi is equal to the energy of psi. And again, only the hydrogen atom with C equal one uh, is susceptible of exact analytic solution because that two body problem can be reduced by uh, to a one body problem by this change of coordinates where you consider the center of mass as a free particle problem. And then um, the distance coordinates um, um, defining uh, the reduced problem and then you can define the reduced mass, etc. But uh, other cases, in addition of the fundamental one of hydrogen are not that easy, even for helium, which is uh, C equal to two, and they need an approximate treatment, starting from the assumption of a fixed nucleus. Uh, there is no way we can do this analytically um, without uh, this approximation, right? I mean, other methods will be approximate um, either numerically, right? Or even analytically themselves, but not exact. So, okay, let's do the first uh, case, which is C equal to, which is helium. And then uh, we'll learn from this simple case, some common features that will apply to the study of the other elements in the periodic table. So C equal to two corresponds to the helium atom. And yeah, I mean, at this point, I only have to substitute Z equal to two, excuse me, the atomic number. And okay. Uh, the Hamiltonian, of course, under the approximation that the nucleus is fixed. So that's the first approximation indicating that the solution is not exact. It's of course having the thought of the nucleus is very massive compared to the electrons and it doesn't move, etc. So the Hamiltonian approximately has this form. Uh, so of course, uh, basically you have uh, only two electrons. That's why you have the two contributions to the kinetic energy over here individually. And then you have each one of the attractions, uh, attraction potentials uh, between the electron and the, and the nucleus. So at this point, okay, this is separable, right? So then we go to our uh, basically old nemesis, which is this one. Um, as I mentioned, okay, this is a coupling term between the uh, interaction uh, of two electrons. And so, first of all, uh, this represents a repulsion because you have two electric charges which are negative. So the two electrons repel each other. So that accounts for the plus sign. 
most importantly, this is the part that makes the problem non-separable. So at this point, all the others are basically hydrogenic, right? And the problem would be separable. But we'll have to do, because of this, again, the problem is simply too difficult mathematically. So we'll have to do a second approximation in the case of helium, which is additionally, we'll have to be forced to neglect for the moment uh, for an analytical treatment, the repulsive interaction between electrons. So again, we do a second approximation where we have simply the um, sum of kinetic energies and uh, the sum of uh, basic attraction potentials, H1 individually. And uh, the second approximation of neglecting the repulsive interaction between electrons is not negligible. So we do it with the conscience that there will be a difference with the uh, experimental result, but we'll analyze why. And of course, I mean, if you think about it for correcting um, these things, we have learned many, many um, methods which can let us uh, basically improve our accuracy of the approximation, like variational method and so on. There are many ways you can do it basically one of the possible ways is to uh, take C as a parameter, uh, not because of um, the number of uh, electrons, but actually kind of the charge, uh, the posit positive charge that the electron actually feels due to screening. But this is not important. My only point is that we'll have to do a very first approximation, a second one, which is to neglect the repulsive interaction, and then in this form, the problem is separable, and we can propose solutions of the basically form of a separated variable. And then we can add them by linear combinations, where basically these are products of individual hydrogenic states, uh, one for electron in position R1 and the other for the electron in position R2. Of course, uh, they have uh, each one quantum numbers and LM that we'll learn from the hydrogenic solution uh, basically the solution to the hydrogen atom, but now with a general charge uh, C, etc. And the NLM can be different, so that's why we uh, add the prime subscripts uh, for R2. So, okay, uh, under this course approximation, the problem is susceptible of solution by separation of variables. And, uh, well, again, we have products of individual hydrogenic functions, um, and for them, the Bohr radius will be reduced by a factor of one half. Um, so the energies uh, are known to depend on the square of the inverse of the Bohr radius. So that means that uh, this factor of one half will be converted into a factor of four when you consider the uh, Bohr energies uh, for hydrogen, right? So what we know are the values for hydrogen and then we'll pick up a factor of four due to this factor of one half or reduction of the Bohr radius for helium. And if you consider the total energy, which of course because this problem is separable, is given by the sum of the two hydrogenic energies, is uh, basically the factor of four that we have mentioned, and then the sum of En plus En prime, since they might be in different energies. And uh, En is speaking the values for hydrogen, uh, which is, uh, you know, read very constant, 13.6 uh, electron volts, blah, 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 divided by N squared. And yeah, this factor of four is related to helium. So, Okay, so far, of course, under the approximation, the problem is manageable. And the ground state, uh, given the lowest energy, of course, would be the case where basically you are at uh, n equal one, n equal zero, n equal zero. Um, and well, if you do uh, the multiplication of these two, because they're exponentials, you get actually this form. So you get the r1 plus r2. Um, and yeah. I mean, you can calculate the ground energy for helium, which is, okay, here you would have E naught plus E naught. So this is two times four E naught. So this is eight uh, times uh, E naught, which is minus 13.6 electron volts. And then you have minus uh, 109 electron volts if you do. Um, so, okay, let's remember that we have a system of two electrons and they are fermions. So the total wave function must be anti-symmetric. Um, so 
clearly this function, uh, the one for the ground state is symmetric, right? So we need to multiply it basically by an anti-symmetric spin. Uh, so that, as we know, is the case of the singlet state and of this form, right? Which we know is specified by quantum numbers uh, zero, zero and with the spin sign tie line, but most importantly uh, with an anti-symmetric function. So, um, okay, so this is the important part that our prediction for the ground energy is uh, far off. So the experimental measurements for the ground energy for helium are basically of minus 79 electron volts. So that's a big jump from minus 109. And the reason is essentially there is no uh, other than, well, I mean, the main one is the fact that we have neglected the repulsive interaction between electrons. In fact, we get a good hint that that's probably the reason because if you go back to your Hamiltonian, um, that repulsive energy is a positive contribution. And so that would make you go basically by adding a positive number from minus 109 to closer to minus 79. So in a way it's expected that we would be far off. Uh, that's in a way uh, at this point what we can do to solve the problem analytically. But okay, we're in good track and then we can perhaps use approximate method. Uh, there can be many ways. One of them is variational method. Uh, in fact, I mean, in a course of atomic physics, you would essentially uh, have as a homework problem to do the calculation of the correction by variational method uh, for obtaining an accurate, um, sorry, ground, uh, ground uh, energy. So, um, okay, let's continue. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, I got distracted by an email that I just got. Um, sorry about it, this always happens. Uh, so, okay, what about the excited states, right? Because at this point I have, um, consider only the, uh, the, the ground state. So actually the excited states will be the form where one individual state, uh, well, linear combinations of the following product. So one of the forms or one individual uh, states will be in one zero zero, like an individual ground state. And the other will be in an excited state. The reason both of them are not or cannot be in excited states basically this one also like with higher energy is because um, there will be enough energy and essentially to ionize one of the electrons. So what would happen if this one was also in an excited state is that it would drop to the ground state. The remaining energy would ionize the other electron and uh, then you basically would have an ion. So the system would become basically helium plus and then the other ion which has been ionized floating up in space um, because uh, basically it escaped the, the potential well in which it was so it would not longer be bounded so okay on this knowledge that the excited states are of this form um, we also know that i mean these are going to be systems of two electrons which must have their symmetries and we already mentioned that uh, they can be represented by this decoupling between position and spin. And uh, so if you consider the, the spatial part, it must have its own symmetry, either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So of course, this is a symmetric combination uh, where you have these two and you add them in a symmetric linear combination and the other is in an anti-symmetric linear combination. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, uh, because you want the total wave function to be anti-symmetric, the symmetric position should be multiplied by anti-symmetric spin and the anti-symmetric uh, spatial part must be multiplied by asymmetric spin. So there are some names for uh, these particular combinations on, hel on helium. So basically solutions with anti-symmetric spin, which of course are singlet cases, are called parahelium. And if you notice, actually, um, that would be the case of the ground state uh, because uh, it's spatially symmetric, so its a spin must be anti-symmetric. Um, 
And then the solutions with basically symmetric spin, as in the triplet, are called orthohelium. And so, although we have distinguished that um, basically the ground state is parahelium, the excited states uh, can be parahelium or orthohelium. So, um, there are some considerations in terms of energies regarding these states, which is that if you revisit what we did in the last lecture, where we had only considered basically the spatial part, is that um, basically symmetric spatial parts or functions of um, spatial functions with uh, basically which are symmetric, uh, basically predict the two particle systems to be closer. So at that point, we identify that with bosons, but that now we know that just for the moment it means, well, that only means that the spatial part is symmetric, right? So for uh, functions uh, for which the spatial part is symmetric, the particles are gonna be closer. And because they're gonna be closer, their interactive repulsion energies for these two electrons will be greater. So they will have high repulsion energies. And uh, as opposed to orthohelium ones, which of course uh, was the opposite case. So that actually has been verified experimentally. So just to get an idea of how the symmetries still play a role in terms of the analysis of basically expected distances between particles and uh, related energies due to repulsive interaction. Okay, so we have learned uh, a good deal from helium, uh, even with the approximation. It at least gives an idea of what we have to do. Um, and well, um, basically we can apply some general features of them uh, up to a point to uh, different atoms and the case of the periodic table. So um, basically it's clear that we will have to neglect the repulsive interaction between electrons to kind of like hand wave our way into the understanding. But I mean, we're conscious of the approximation that we're making. so. We'll, Hopefully we can correct that with an approximate method later on. And uh, when we neglect the repulsive interaction, the Hamiltonian is separable. And again, we propose uh, separable solutions. And uh, in those separable solutions individually, the electrons will occupy hydrogenic states uh, identified by quantum numbers NLM. So there's a name for that basically in atomic physics and for these hydrogenic states NLM and they are called orbitals. That has to do with uh, basically quantum theory, early versions, etc. So, uh, well, yeah, as we mentioned, the potential that we consider in the approximation is the attraction of the electrons to the nucleus. The nucleus has a charge of CE, of course, uh, since we have assumed neutrality of the atom uh, at the beginning. And uh, yeah, I mean, because now we have more electrons, we have to be more careful regarding how the exclusion principle. So again, still stands the fact that the total wave function made of a spatial part and a spin part for our system of electrons must be anti-symmetric. And clearly the Pauli exclusion principle states that basically two electrons cannot occupy the same orbital state and the same spin. So basically um, if two electrons are in the same orbital, the state which is taking care of the spatial part, the spins must be anti-aligned and actually uh, actually, I want to be more precise in the singlet state, yeah. So, uh, actually, yeah, because the important feature is that they're in the singlet because it's the anti symmetry, what matters not much the anti alignment. Um, so, okay, and there is another uh, consideration uh, regarding basically the orbitals is that uh, the number of states. Um, with a given energy. So which basically is the degeneracy of the energy eigenvalue EN for hydrogenic states. And that degeneracy is of order N squared. Um, you probably did this calculation in your previous quantum course when you studied the hydrogen atom, but if you didn't, the reason is that the degeneracy of the energy eigenspace uh, EN is N squared is because for L you have uh, options of zero to N minus one. Given L, you have options for M to be between minus L to L. And so basically the total number of options is the sum from L equal to zero to L equal to N minus one. And each one of these is of course the case where you go from minus L to L uh, in steps of one. 
or um, and that basically means that here you have uh, two L plus one uh, states for a given L. And if you do the sum, of course, at this point, this becomes a, um, one of these uh, nice series that you're familiar with. So the first one, you basically take out the factor of two, then you have, uh, remember, well, the L equal to zero is not gonna matter too much for this first part, but remember that you're ending the uh, sum at uh, N minus one. So that's why you have n times n minus one divided by two. The other is simpler is because um, you have one n times from zero to n minus one is the same as for one to n. So that's why you have n. And the factor of two balances, and then you can factorize by n. They have n minus one plus one. So this is n times n, n squared. So, okay, that is a quick proof. Um, so, well, the different levels, uh, are going to be called shells in this uh, atomic uh, setting. And uh, well, each shell identified by n, of course, can fit uh, two n squared electrons. So n squared is related precisely to the degeneracy of the eigenspace, and then a factor of two related to basically the spin, right? Um, uh, yeah, up or down, etc. I mean, it's basically the revisiting of the public exclusion principle that we mentioned, uh, that you have to be in the single state if you are in the same orbital, so that you do not violate Pauli exclusion principle. So if you go into details of the particular shells, basically the shell n equal one can fit two electrons, that's clear. n equal two can fit two n squared, so two times four, which is eight. Then n equal three, basically two times uh, nine, which is 18, etc. And so if you go to the periodic table, so this is where I'm gonna start to talk about it, it's organized in such a way that the rows are related to the shell that you're filling. So first row, n equal one, uh, second row, uh, n equal to two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we still have to give more info regarding the repulsive energy between electrons. Uh, so wait a little bit about it. Um, so let's go for the case of helium quickly that we have analyzed in terms of the Hamiltonian, but perhaps we have not talked about it in regards to the periodic table and the orbitals. So, okay, helium has a C equal to two protons, of course. Uh, and well, again, we're working with neutral atoms by assumption. So basically the two electrons have already filled the shell n equal one, so that's clear. So let's go for the case. Uh, and of course, uh, helium is here in the periodic table. Um, we go to the case Z equal to three, which is lithium, which is a case over here. And basically the third electron has to be put in the next shell, which is n equal to two. Um, so there is an effect um, when you have many atoms, uh, which is uh, called screening. And you have to consider it uh, when you start filling basically uh, the shells and the orbitals. Because, well, the pore energies uh, do not depend on L, right? I mean, we have introduced no man magnetic effect at this point. Uh, but there is an effect due to the repulsive interaction, which we're going to handle in a hand wavy way uh, at this point, which basically the repulsive interaction will force us to choose the lowest value of L, uh, which would be the case where L equal to zero, and that is because of the following. So angular momentum throws electron in the upper shell out. And so because it's thrown in the upper shell out, the one electron that is out uh, sees less charge because what it sees from afar is the combined charge of the nucleus and the other electron, which is closer. So that effect is called screening because the electron with its negative charge is screening the positive charge of the nucleus. So uh, that's important uh, precisely to, on how to fill the states because I mean, if you have this screening effect, it will see less charge and this upper electron will be less coupled to the nucleus or to the atom. So its energy will be higher. And because you're filling states according to energy, uh, that means that uh, you have to pick basically angular momentum that it's lower as uh, so in the case for L equal to zero. That is the hand wave description of how this works. And essentially it's due to a screening effect. Um, so, uh, basically, the state of lowest energy in a show will be L equal to zero. Again, with this consideration, basically the bond to the nucleus will be stronger uh, when we have many electrons, of course. 
And let's revisit lithium, right? So we were saying, okay, we were in the n equal to uh, two shell, which shell to choose will be L equal to zero precisely because of this. And uh, so the orbital for this uh, electron will be two zero zero. And uh, well, I mean, here the consideration is the same. And uh, basically we have to add the other electron in the same orbital, but um, basically with a spin opposite uh, to the one of the third electron, uh, basically forming a single. Um, well, so we have z equal to five, um, which is born, yeah. So, okay, let me go back to my periodic table. So we were uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. Then we have uh, five, which is boron. And again, I mean, what about the other atom, right? So we have a uh, higher C, so we have a new, uh, sorry, electron. And so now it has to occupy L equal to one as the two electrons for L equal to zero uh, uh, or the orbital two zero zero have been filled. And uh, basically this indicates how you have to fill the shell. And the shell will be filled until you reach the neon which is C equal to 10, which is a noble element, right? I mean, there's no surprise uh, why the noble elements uh, do not uh, uh, react or have a hard time. So, well, now you go to the shell N equal to three, which of course starts with sodium, um, which has a C atomic number 11. And uh, basically, uh, okay, you start with the orbital 300, which will be filled for magnesium, uh, which is uh, C equal to 12. And uh, if you go basically to um, the filling of N equal to, uh, to three for the others, so you have six other possibilities because uh, L equal to one has uh, two times three uh, cases. And uh, basically, uh, well, you'll go from aluminum, which is equal to th 13, to argon, which is again a noble element, uh, where basically all the orbitals are filled at that point. And um, there's something important to mention, that when you get to n equal to three, but l equal to two, the screen effects are very strong. And so, because the electron still is charged, this allows them to jump to basically the next uh, shell and that happens for uh, potassium, which is equal to 19, which is what happens when you go from basically argon to potassium. And then calcium is equal to 20, where again, you fill the shell n equal to four, L equal to zero, or uh, sorry, the orbital, uh, basically four, zero, zero. Um, and so the important part is that this orbital four, zero, zero is occupied before it touches uh, n equal to three and n equal to two. And then you go um, to the next element, right? So basically, um, whoa, sorry. The next elements fill n equal to three and l equal to two, and then n equal to four and l equal to one. Uh, basically, you get at a point where krypton is full. And uh, yeah, then you would jump to the next uh, shell, which is n equal to five, blah, blah, blah. And until later on, basically the L equal to two and L equal to three states with N equal to four are filled. And so that defines a good part of the structure of the periodic table, as you can see below. So maybe I'll use my figure uh, so that it's uh, easier to look at this, but okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I chose this periodic table because it's including also the electronic configuration. So if you look at the notation in here, so you have the symbol, of course, Example is this one, which is hydrogen, the name of the element, the atom under consideration. Then you have the electronic configuration, which I will explain in a second, and then the atomic number. So here you would have the Z, here the name of the element uh, of the atom under consideration, then of course the full name, and then the electron configuration that I will explain in a second. So uh, yeah. Uh, I have to, to make a couple of comments. So, okay, I actually posted the link and the references for this table. I'll also post the table itself on the Blackboard. 
But yeah, I mean, usually this is what you would see in a course of atomic physics. We have enough background to look at it at this point. Um, but something that you may have even seen before is basically the spectroscopic notation for atomic state, because uh, that might pop up in hydrogen atom. So basically, this spectroscopic notation is classifying a series of spectral lines that were observed experimentally long ago in the beginning of uh, this quantum theory uh, deal. So basically, the case L equal to zero is denoted by a letter S, which stands for sharp series. L equal to one is denoted by a letter P in the spectroscopic notation, which is a letter notation. Uh, P stands for principal series. L equal to two by D, which is diffuse series um, of spectral lines. Then L equal to three by F, which stands for fundamental and so on. Actually, there is um, uh, at this point after F, you go alphabetically like G, H, I. Uh, be mindful that J is skipped and then you continue with K, L, blah, blah, blah. So the state of the electron, this is specified by N and L. At this point, the quantum number N is not important for the sake that you are not introducing a magnetic field. And also, if you notice, what we have indicated so far is basically how the orbitals are filled. Um, so that's perhaps what we need at this point in our considerations. So, well, uh, again, N, the number N specifies the shell. So we're going to call it the number. And L, it's indicating the letter, which uh, indicates the orbital angular momentum. Um, then what we're going to do is to add an exponent to indicate the number of electrons occupying the respective state. So for example, for carbon, which if I go back to uh, over here, um, right here. So basically I'm with six, uh, C equal to six. So I'll have six electrons. And then I have uh, basically I would write uh, carbon in this way in uh, the following notation, which is basically the electronic configuration notation. So 1s uh, basically will have two electrons. 2s will also have two electrons. And the last two electrons will be in the 2p. So these two electrons will be basically in a combination of the orbitals 211, 210, and 21 minus 1. So if um, basically you start feeling like this, the, um, the different states, uh, you would have this notation for electronic configuration. In fact, the reason I chose again this table is because, um, let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, uh, this uh, notation is indicated over here. So if you look at it, this was the electronic configuration for hydrogen. Then later on, you have the electronic configuration for the different elements. So I'll post the table on Blackboard. And of course, you can also download it from the link that I'll, I have put on the references. Um, so uh, let's see where I was. Where was I? OK, yeah. And so again, in my periodic table that I showed you, the electron configuration is indicated in particular. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, the example of carbon that I just presented were these two electrons, which feel the, or sorry, which are in the 2p, uh, basically have quantum numbers n equal 2 and l equal 1, and then possible combinations. Um, so there is something to be considered because, okay, what I'm saying is like, okay, for an individual electron, in which orbital it, it can be. Now, what about the total orbital angular momentum? due to their contribution, right? So basically, um, these other uh, shells or uh, orbitals were uh, having L equal to zero. So the contribution to the total orbital angular momentum is actually related only to the electrons in 2p. And so uh, basically, the total orbital angular momentum can be either two, one, or zero because you have L equal to one a little l for each one of them. So capital L for the total orbital momentum, two when they're added to each other, zero when they cancel, etc. So about the spin, um, well, electrons uh, or electron pairs with L equal to zero in their respective shell uh, have not aligned spin in the singlet states, like many for cases like this. So 
uh, that of course that comes from public solution principle, but the contribution to the spin for uh, those uh, 1s and 2s are zero. So uh, basically what happens is that the spin, uh, the total spin is also due to the electrons in the 2p. And well, we don't know if they're in a singlet or a triplet state at this point, but the total spin for this case basically could uh, have uh, values of either zero or one. One is the case where the plus one half and plus one half are added and zero when they are basically in the anti-alignment. At this point, we know that they're in linear combinations and nothing more. Now, uh, this is basically consider, considering the total orbital angular momentum. This is considering the total, total spin, which is basically the total intrinsic angular momentum. And the grand total angular momentum is basically denoted by a capital J which is adding the contributions of the orbital plus the spin, which is again an intrinsic angular momentum. And then, I mean, meaning that if capital L can be two, one, or zero, and S zero, one, basically J can be three, two, one, or zero. And there is a system to also write this um, uh, in a notation in the following form. So as an upper index, you have two S plus one, as a lower index, uh, you have a capital J. Notice that S is also capital. And then what you do is actually to write a letter, which uh, a letter uh, uh, is a letter that depends on basically the um, total orbital angular momentum. So it's basically a letter from spectroscopic notation, but capitalized. So remember from spectroscopic notation, you had S, P, D, F, where here, basically depending on the value of uh, capital L, you'll have uh, basically capital S, capital P, capital D, blah, blah, blah. So it's better to show it by an example as in carbon, where, well, for carbon specifically, I'm not gonna do the account, but I'm just gonna give the result. The total spin is S equal to one. The total orbital angular momentum is uh, capital L equal to one. So basically remember that little L was corresponding to little P, well, now big L uh, equal to one is gonna correspond to uh, capital P. And the grand total angular momentum is zero. So in this notation, if I do this, okay, carbon would be represented with a P because capital P because capital L is equal to one. Then you have two S or two capital S plus one, which is two times one plus one. So you have three and then J is equal to zero. So that's the notation. Um, so you can actually check this notation uh, as in this form of the total angular momentum uh, for the first row of the periodic table in Griffiths. Uh, so check it in the book. And just to mention that the rules to determine basically these values uh, that I gave you for carbon, for total L, total S, total J, blah, 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 for a given atom are, have a name and they are known as the Hund uh, rules. You would go deeper into that in a course on atomic physics. I'm not sure if we will consider this at this point, um, maybe we will, uh, if we have time, if not, we have to pass on it. But okay, uh, at this point, I tried to give you a brief summary of basically, you think about it, uh, spin considerations. Once you consider spin, how the symmetrization principle for many particle wave functions uh, are uh, handled and are revisiting of public solution principle. And after we know basically the symmetries or anti-symmetries of uh, bosons and fermions, uh, considering the spin, uh, visit atoms, uh, give a simple example of the helium atom, and then see what applies in general. And of course, present some notation regarding orbital shells, uh, spectroscopic notation, etc., for the periodic table of the elements. And there are some references, of course, uh, part of that check on Griffith, some other of my previous notes on quantum mechanics and atomic physics. And uh, yeah, also the table of the elements that I presented you, which I will post on uh, Blackboard. So good luck, and I hope uh, you are excited by looking at the periodic table of the elements today.